Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. As someone who spends a lot of time thinking about the past, who explores primary sources as a way to try to acquire a grasp on the lives of those who lived before, you do begin to notice that there are certain names that pop up time and again. Occasionally, they will be the author and or recipient of a host of texts that represent an invaluable mine of information. Today's subject is just such a person. But before we take a look at today's topic, I want to say an absolutely massive thank you to History Hit for sponsoring another video on this channel. This week, I have really been enjoying watching Dan Snow explore a history of England. England. Green. Pleasant and full of history. Here in little old England, you can see mighty Stone Age sites. You can visit Roman remains, early Anglo-Saxon, early medieval places, also high medieval castles and palaces. There's so much to see. And I want you to join me as I set out on an epic journey across England a whirlwind expedition through hundreds of miles of countryside and thousands of years of history, exploring some of the remarkable places in the care of English heritage, where great turning points in England's past have happened, from the Stone Age to the Nuclear Age. I love the idea of a road trip through English history, partly because I'm from England, I was born here, I've grown up with these stories and places, and I love the story of our history, of how we came to be the people that we are. Hundreds of miles, tens of thousands of years of history, one road trip. I love this series and I know that you will too. History Hit brings you the stories that shape the world through their award-winning online history channel and podcast network. It's like Netflix, but it's all history. With History Hit, you can stream and download hundreds of hours of original history documentaries anywhere, anytime, on any device. You can watch on your mobile, tablet, desktop, Xbox or your TV. Brought to you by expert historians such as Dan Snow, Professor Susanna Lipscomb, Dan Jones and more. And as well as already having hundreds of expert-led programmes, they add two more every week. Click the link in my description box to find out more and to subscribe to History Hit. As an added bonus, History Hit offering my viewers a very special discount. If you use the code READINGTHEPAST30, you will get 30% off of an annual subscription. Thanks again to History Hit for sponsoring this video. But now it's time to talk about the life, letters and legacy of Eustace Chapuis. In 1895, A.J. Carlyle, writing for the English Historical Review, stated, quote, probably before the publication of the Venetian and Spanish calendars, meaning the calendars of letters and state papers, no one would ever have guessed at the immense importance of foreign archives in enabling English people to read in its true light the history of their own nation. But what is most surprising in the whole matter is the light thrown upon the gossip of the English court by the dispatches of the Venetian and still more by those of the Spanish ambassadors of the reign of Henry VIII. The dispatches of Eustace Chapuis are more valuable in this respect than all the accumulated treasures of the record office and the Cotonian library in the British Museum which I think we might all agree is high praise indeed. There are a lot of extant documents that we could explore today. As we will see, Chapuis' career spans some of the most significant and indeed turbulent years in Tudor England. With this, understandably, came much for him to inform his master of. So what I'm getting at is that at best we're going to be scratching the surface today, and if you are minded to look into Chapuis misses for yourself, then here's how I do it. While many of the state papers are not available online, there are a number that are. I go to British History Online. Lots of their content is open access and so freely available, but there is some that is behind a paywall. 
I get institutional access to this resource through the London Library, which I pay a yearly subscription to access. However, it is worth checking with your local library or archive because they may have on offer access to this resource for free in one of their reading rooms. When you are on the British History Online website, you can either simply search for the name Chapuis and then work your way through each result, or instead you can search by date. The Calendar of State Papers Foreign and Domestic and the Calendar of State Papers Spain are the locations that I would suggest you head for first if you are on your own Chapuis search. Eustace Chapuis was born in the Duchy of Savoy in around 1490. He followed his father into the law. It is claimed that Chapuis' mother came from a noble family, albeit a minor and impoverished one. Chapuis would show himself to be academically gifted. His university career commenced in 1507 at the University of Turin. He studied civil and canon law. At some point, he appears to have moved to continue his studies in Rome. His aptitude in this field was recognised when he received his doctorate. He would come to the attention of his peers who would seek to befriend him, and he would also come to the attention of those whose position would allow them to promote him. In 1517, he entered the service of the Bishop of Geneva, Jean de Savoy. He acted as his official. He was also at this time made a canon of Geneva Cathedral. His responsibilities to his new master required him to preside over his ecclesiastical court and also to represent him in the city's government. So in short, exactly the sort of tasks that his civil and canon law training would have prepared him for. It would, I imagine, have felt like a challenging time to be working for the Roman Catholic Church. Because on the 31st of October, 1517, so the precise year that Chapuis had started working for Jean de Savoy, Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on that church door in Wittenberg. As for Geneva, this was a city where Chapuis's master vied with the Duke of Savoy over their respective claims to the overlordship and governance of that city, while certain inhabitants of the city itself were keen to assert their independence from both of these figures. To do so, they showed themselves to be willing to forge an alliance with a whole collection of Swiss cities. These tensions, which Chapuis would at points be tasked with trying to cool diplomatically, would surely be an excellent experience for the many challenges that he would face in the future. The death of Jean de Savoy in 1522 led to the appointment of Pierre de la Baume as his successor. Chapuis thus had a new master. In the next year, 1523, Charles, Duke of Bourbon's attempted betrayal of his king, Francis I of France, was uncovered. Charles promptly fled and entered the service of another Charles, the Emperor Charles V. Chapuis was sent on missions to the Duke of Bourbon, where he was tasked with acting on the interests of both the bishop he served and the Duke of Savoy. And Chapuis' work in this regard would necessitate his absence from Geneva, which in turn would require him to deputise someone else so that they could act on his behalf there. In 1526, Chapuis entered the employ of the Duke of Bourbon, which would lead to him travelling to Granada and to the court of Charles V. There, he acted as Bourbon's representative. The Duke of Bourbon was killed during the sack of Rome on the 6th of May 1527, He was, at this time, leading troops for Charles V. Chapuis' skills had not gone unnoticed, and so he was soon enjoying the patronage of one of Charles V's leading ministers, Nicolas de Pernod, Signor de Granville. Chapuis' mastery of civil and canon law would prove very useful, as Charles V set about gathering the resources that he was prepared to spare in order to support his aunt, Catherine of Aragon as she attempted to weather the storm of her husband Henry VIII's great matter. Chapuis proved himself to be a strong and capable advocate for Catherine's cause during the negotiations with Henry's representatives in April 1529. As the English king and queen's marital state became more complicated and contentious, it was increasingly clear that Charles V's aims may be better served by replacing his current ambassador to England, Inigo de Mendoza, with an individual who had the legal and linguistic skills to best advise Catherine. 
Chapuis was issued with his credentials on the 19th of May 1529. He received his instructions on the 25th of June and he arrived in London by the 1st of September. He met with Mendoza on this journey and was briefed by him. In his first dispatch to the Emperor, dated to September the 1st, so when he was newly arrived in London, he accurately recounted just how far from royal favour Cardinal Thomas Wolsey had fallen. He stated that the Cardinal's failure to obtain Henry's annulment was the cause of this, coupled with the concerted efforts of a faction that had long been bent upon his ruin. On September the 4th, Chapuis reported that, quote, the Queen's business is now at a standstill, before adding in cipher, quote, the King's affection for La Belaine, meaning Anne Boleyn, increases daily. It is so great just now that it can hardly be greater. Such is the intimacy and familiarity in which they live at present. May God remedy it all. It appears then that from the very beginning, Chapuis has hit the ground running. He is able to provide intelligence to his master at once. However, it is worth remembering that this was very much the job. Chapuis was expected to send regular dispatches and it simply would not do for them to be nothing more than a comment on how little he was able to find out. And so we should perhaps question how much of this information, at least at this early stage, came from Chapuis' contact and time spent with people at the heart of the English court, rather than what he had managed to pick up from English or indeed European gossip of the time. I think perhaps this might be debatable. Chapuis certainly had a pre-existing network of academics, merchants and indeed ambassadors who could have provided him with guidance and information. Chapuis' first meeting with Henry VIII took place on September the 14th and we do get a detailed account of this first meeting in his dispatch that's dated to September the 21st, 1529. Chapuis reported how the king was quick to draw him into conversation, how he seemed keen to debate with him about his great matter. It is a long missive full of details. At one point, Chapuis reports that Henry asked him, quote, Do you imagine that I have acted lightly in this case? Not the least. I would never believe those who spoke to me without first discussing the question and consulting books about it. Chapuis then proceeds to write, I saw that the king by these words meant to drag me into a polemic about the validity of the marriage, and therefore shunned as much as possible the discussion of this point for two reasons. The first and principal, the defence of your imperial majesty's acts and interference in the affair. The other, that there are already books written on the subject in which this matter of the attempted divorce has been sufficiently discussed. So much so that there is no need of further argumentation for or against it. Prior to this, in his letter, Chapuis also explained that he had already sought an audience with Catherine of Aragon. He reported that she would not meet him without the king's permission. Instead, she told Chapuis that she would send her physician to him When he wrote to the emperor, he explained that, quote, The queen fulfilled her promise and accordingly sent me her physician, whom I met as I was leaving the house, surrounded as I was at the time by officers from the king's household, who accompanied and escorted me through the streets of this capital. It is a mystery to me how the said physician dared to make in their presence a summary of what had occurred in the divorce case, the origin and causes of it etc. This was the work of the ambassador, at least the part of it that was not strict diplomacy. This is them obtaining information in as much detail from as reliable a source as possible, that they could relay it back to the individual or individuals whose interests they were representing as their ambassador. Now, Chapuis had an open line of communication with the embattled English queen. In the case of Chapuis, his master's interests at this time extended to how things played out in the most personal spaces of England. For Charles V, how his aunt, Catherine of Aragon, and his cousin Mary were treated was certainly of personal familial concern, but it was also a matter of diplomacy and statecraft. Should the Empress family members be mistreated or downgraded by a foreign king, that may be something that was personally painful. But it was also a public insult, one that could not be ignored. 
lest it should go towards making Charles appear weak. On top of this, the threat from schismatic religion was also a point of great concern for this holy Roman emperor and for his canon law expert. Chapuy thus had to both learn and share information, but also, where required, advise various parties on how they should act in order to safeguard their place, their international reputation, even to protect the Holy See of Rome. I will be linking my videos dealing with Henry VIII's queens, his great matter and the Reformation as further context, but suffice to say that Chapuy's correspondence has proved to be a vital resource to support my and countless other historians' understanding of this period and its major players. Chapuy advised Catherine. He kept the emperor informed of her plight. He warned of the growing danger posed as he saw it by reforming religion. He spoke of how vital he felt it was that the Pope should issue his ruling on the matter of the marriage quickly. And upon this point, the Emperor seemed to be in agreement. Chapuy also suggested ways that his master, the Emperor, could show his support for any papal sanction by imposing his own embargo upon England, if it should come to that. Chapuy collected accounts from dissatisfied individuals in England who might, he hoped, come out in rebellion against Henry's actions. In addition to his suggestions about trading sanctions, Chapuy would also hint at the value of military support from the Emperor for any uprising that might break out in England. But then, everything changed in 1533. Henry VIII, having previously made himself supreme head of the church in England, was determined to have what he wanted. Anne Boleyn was recognised as his lawful wife, and was crowned as his queen on the 1st of June 1533. Catherine of Aragon was now found to have never been his wife. She was instead the Dowager Princess of Wales. Henry and Catherine's daughter was therefore no princess. She was simply the Lady Mary, the king's natural daughter. On each of these points, Charles V vehemently disagreed, as did many others, Catherine and Mary included. Chapuy continued to refer to Catherine as the Queen. As for Anne, he referred to her as the Lady, or the Lady Anne. When he reported on the birth of Elizabeth, Chapuy wrote to the Emperor, quote, On Sunday last, on the eve of Lady Day, about three o'clock in the afternoon, the King's mistress was delivered of a girl, to the great disappointment and sorrow of the King, of the Lady herself, and of others of her party, and to the great shame and confusion of physicians, astrologers, wizards and witches, all of whom affirmed that it would be a boy. This use of the term Lady may differ from the frankly commonly held perception of how Chapuy used to refer to Anne. As Lauren Mackay points out, quote, It is claimed throughout his embassy that Chapuy's title of choice for Anne was La Poutin, or the concubine, and Elizabeth her daughter, the little bastard. But having studied Chapuy's original letters, which are housed in Vienna, it seems that crossed wires and mistaken identity have polluted the truth over the centuries. She goes on to explain that, with the exception of one heated letter in 1533, Chapuy only refers to Anne as the concubine as late as 1535. Prior to this, almost all of his letters referred to her as the Lady, Lady Anne, the new Marchioness, and so on. Thomas Cromwell comes to feature frequently in Chapuy's dispatches. The Empress Man will on occasion present what Cromwell has said to him, but he will then offer his interpretation of Cromwell's true meaning. He will detail Cromwell's facial expressions as if to highlight there being some other meaning behind the words he has said. And so, while Chapuy was thus always guarded in regard to what Cromwell said and what he actually meant, it is also apparent, I believe, that these two men actually enjoyed each other's company. They would go hawking together, they would dine with each other, and they would verbally spar. Their master's relationships may have been incredibly strained at points, but Cromwell and Chapuy's willingness, perhaps even preference to spend time with each other, must have made both of their jobs easier. When Chapuy wrote to his emperor, on the basis of his interactions with Thomas Cromwell, he was reporting interactions with a man who knew that his words and actions were going to be reported. That may sound obvious, but I want to point out that I believe that Thomas Cromwell had both the composure and the skill to use this knowledge to his 
and his king's advantage. This is, I think, worth remembering when we seek to explore Shapwee's dispatches, or indeed any primary source, because the information we can get out of these sources will only ever be as good as the information that went in. And there are multiple reasons why these sources may intentionally or accidentally be deceiving us. Shapwee himself could have personally chosen to omit or overstate certain parts of his reports. He's also getting his information from spies and from members of the Tudor court. These courtiers we know are trained in, frankly, deception. They know that Shapwee is reporting back. It's in their interest, their king's and their country's interest, to make sure he hears what they want him to and that he doesn't hear what they don't want him to. Because Shapwee is the route to get a message to Charles V, and they all know this. When he learned of Catherine's failing health, Shapwee applied for permission to go and see her in person. He waited, and when no answer was returned, or at least no answer was returned fast enough, Shapwee set off for Kimbolton, where Catherine was, with a large retinue. It seems clear to me that Shapwee had making a spectacle in mind. A message did come as he neared Kimbolton that he was not to be admitted there. And so he waited five miles away and sent members of his retinue to provide noisy entertainments all around the house. Shapwee was finally granted permission to visit Catherine on the 29th of December and he was with her from the 2nd to the 6th of January. Catherine died on the 7th of January, 1536. On the 21st of January, Shapwee informed the emperor that, quote, now that the good queen is dead, they are trying in various ways to catch the princess in their net and make her subscribe to their damnable statutes and detestable opinions. Just over a week later, on the 29th of January, he wrote, I heard some days ago from various quarters, though I must say none sufficiently reliable, that the king's concubine, though she showed great joy at the news of the good queen's death and gave a good present to the messenger who brought her the intelligence, had nevertheless cried and lamented herself on the occasion, fearing lest she herself might be brought to the same end as her. And this very morning, someone coming from the lady mentioned in my letter of the 21st November last, and also from her husband, has stated that both had heard from the lips of one of the principal courtiers that this king had said to one of them in great secrecy, and as if in confession, that he had been seduced and forced into this second marriage by means of sortilages and charms, and that owing to that, he held it as null. God, he said, had well shown his displeasure at it by denying him male children. He therefore considered that he could take a third wife, which he said he wished much to do. On the 18th of April, 1536, Shapwee was essentially tricked into being in Anne's presence, something that he had studiously managed to avoid for the previous seven years or so. And he had avoided it because to ignore Anne, to refuse to do her reverence, would have been an all-out show of disrespect, the very opposite of diplomacy. However, to acknowledge her, to give her reverence, was akin to a tacit recognition of Anne's place as Henry's wife and queen. On this occasion, Chapuis was trapped. The pair acknowledged one another and exchanged reverences. And here comes the mystery. Because why was this situation orchestrated? Why on this occasion, at this point, was it so important that Anne was recognised by Chapuis. And it's even more of a mystery when we think about the date. This is happening in April 1536. Within weeks, and throughout May 1536, Chapuis would be detailing the fall of Anne Boleyn and her faction. Just why he was made to recognise her those few weeks before is one of those enduring questions of history. I do wonder what you think was going on. In a letter dated to the 18th of May 1536, so the day before Anne's execution, Chapuis wrote to his former patron, Monsignor de Granville, who, as I mentioned previously, was one of the emperor's leading advisers. Chapuis informed him of what his spy had told him about Anne during her imprisonment. One of the ladies with her at this time was, Chapuis states, his informant. 
Chapuy writes that, quote, From the very beginning of her incarceration, the lady I allude to, his spy, sent to communicate to me certain facts concerning the Messalina. Apart, among others, that she heard her say that she could not imagine who could have made her lose the king's favour and love, save me. For she pretends that from the very moment of my arrival at this court, the king no longer looked upon her with the same eyes as before. I confess that I was rather flattered by the compliment and consider myself very lucky at having escaped her vengeance. For kind-hearted and merciful as she is, she would, without remorse, have cast me to the dogs. Two other English gentlemen have been imprisoned along with her, and it is suspected that a good many more will share the same fate. For the king has been heard to say that he believes that upwards of a hundred gentlemen have had criminal connection with her. You never saw a prince or husband show or wear his horns more patiently and lightly than this one does. I leave you to guess the cause of it. I find it telling that although he links Anne to the scandalous Messalina, Chapuis' reports of Henry's patience in the face of his wife's apparent disloyalty seem to me to point to Chapuis having doubts about Anne's guilt in this matter that saw her and many of her friends mounting the executioner's scaffold on Henry's orders. Chapuis does appear to have thought, or perhaps simply hoped, that the fall of Anne, the annulment of her marriage, and the bastardisation of her daughter Elizabeth would lead to Mary being recognised once more as, quote, the true heir to the kingdom, that he, meaning her father Henry VIII, will now have her declared and sworn to as such, and as his legitimate daughter, born of a marriage legitimated propter bonum fidem parentum. In this, though, Chapuis had misjudged Henry, and he would find himself to be disappointed. Mary's father's affection, indeed the safety of Mary herself and of all those she held dear, was swiftly shown to be contingent on her full capitulation. C.S.L. Davies explains that, quote, Chapuis rescued her, meaning Mary, by getting her to sign a series of papers without reading them and writing a letter of submission to the king, while making himself responsible for securing absolution from the Pope. With Mary at last returned to her father's good graces, and very keen to remain there, her reliance on Chapuis diminished. Similarly, Chapuis now had far less cause to attempt to intervene on matters within England. Although with that being said, some have suggested that Chapuis was a secret, even a principal conspirator, in the formation of the Pilgrimage of Grace. However, this is a highly contested and disputed theory. Based on what I have seen, I think that at most, Chapuis might have been given a hint that something like this was afoot. I mean, after all, as I have mentioned previously, Chapuis did make it his business to find out who in England was unhappy with the direction their country was moving in. Included in this number were, of course, people who were involved in the Pilgrimage of Grace. And so perhaps Chapuis was given some prior warning, although this is by no means certain. After 1536, Chapuis involved himself in the more traditional duties of an ambassador, working at the behest of his emperor, such as floating Charles V-approved candidates for Mary's hand in marriage, and also for Henry's hand in marriage following the death of Jane Seymour in 1537. Then, the 1538 Treaty of Nice, which saw a 10-year truce agreed between Charles V and Francis I occurred, and this made Henry and England very nervous. Chapuis was summoned to the Netherlands in March 1539. However, by 1540, the strain between France and the Empire was already starting to show. Chapuis was sent back to England in July 1540. He would arrive there just a few days before Thomas Cromwell was executed. With Charles V and Francis I increasingly at odds with each other, Chapuis' role was to seek to create an alliance between Henry and Charles that would leave Francis out in the cold. Of course, the French ambassador to Henry's court was seeking to counter this and forge an alliance between Henry and Francis. An Anglo-Spanish treaty was sealed in 1543 and Henry promptly declared war on France. Henry led his army in their attack on France in July 1544. Chapuis, 
Discontented and almost certainly in quite a bit of pain from the gout that had plagued him for some time, was with Henry for this campaign. Then, Charles V made his own peace with Francis on September the 18th, 1544. He did so allegedly with Henry's knowledge and agreement. However, this claim would later be disputed by the English king. Chapuy was thus placed in the firing line of Henry's recriminations, displeasure and complaints. Henry would argue at length that the earlier 1543 treaty bound Charles to support England against France, whether that be in English attempts to hold on to the French territories they had recently taken, territories like Boulogne, or whether they should help to defend England itself against threats of French aggression. These threats did seem to be a real possibility during the summer of 1545. Chapuis had been hoping to retire for quite some time, but these disputes, this conflict, this heightened situation did put his retirement off. He was finally released from his service in July 1545. I mean, I say released, but he wasn't going to get much chance to rest because he was still being called upon to give his opinion on a host of English matters. He continued to advise his replacement as ambassador, van der Delft, on the orders of Charles V. Indeed, he produced a letter dated to the 29th of January 1547. This was the day after Henry VIII's death, but presumably this letter was written without the knowledge that that death had occurred. In this letter, Chapuis writes to Catherine Parr. He is writing to her from his place of retirement, Louvain. He offered a clear-eyed analysis of the national and international situation that England found herself in as her king lay dying, and as the king that followed him, would take up his throne as a child. As I just mentioned, Chapuis had retired to Louvain. As we know, he was not idle. In addition to continuing to offer diplomatic advice, he also founded a grammar school at Annecy and a college at Louvain. I mean, after all, his own educational opportunities and clear academic skill had set him apart and it had in many ways made his professional successes possible. Chapuis had been born in Annecy. By founding this grammar school, and by providing a number of scholarships to go with it, it seems to me that Shapley was keen to ensure that other boys, just like him, might get a similar chance to excel. Shapley died on the 21st of January 1556, and he was buried in the chapel of his college. So what do you think of Eustace Shapley, of his life, letters and legacy? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video. I would also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because that will boost the engagement. And the more engagement a video gets, the more YouTube shares it out, which will in turn help us to grow this community. I do have to say, when it comes to an ambassador like Shapui, there's not an emoji that immediately springs to mind. But I am fascinated to think about what you're going to pick and I would love to find out. So do pop your choice in the comment section. You can also find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some of all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please share it with some friends. In fact, if you like the channel, let some pals know about it. You can tell me you like this video in particular by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel. And if you think you're subscribed, now's the time to check. Make sure that YouTube hasn't unsubscribed you against your will. And while you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear so that YouTube will, they claim, let you know when I've next uploaded and also when I am next going live, which I do to talk about the history news. And I know you are not going to want to miss that. We have now, of course, got our fail safe. You can head to my website, www.katrinamarchant.com. It will be linked in the description and make sure you add your email address to my mailing list box. It's in the contact page. And that way I can email you with the links of all of the videos that I am planning to put up. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye for now. 